Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Aaron Steed, and I am the State Signal Maintenance Engineer for GDAC. Uh, today's presentation will be over the traffic signal spec update information. Um, I'm the main point of contact for the GDAC specs as far as traffic signals are concerned, as well as the traffic signal portion of the qualified product list. Um, and today, thankfully, I'll be joined by Mark, Mark Stark and Travis Hurt of AECOM to help present this information. In addition to today's presentation regarding traffic signal specifications, there will be one more additional ITS Georgia open house in which we will cover the ITS portion of the new GDOT specs. Uh, this open house will occur on May 26 from 3 to 4 p.m. What is a specification? Specifications are instructions developed by the designer as a detailed project delivery process for the contractor. And it's also for the purpose of bidding and construction. They also serve as documents that provide a complete process for furnishing materials and installing those materials, which include the testing, warranty, training, and other information. Uh, we'll make sure that everyone is provided with a direct link um, to the new current GDI specifications. Um, if you notice, if you, if you navigate to the GDI website, you may see links for previous year specifications. Um, you can now ignore those specs as the 2021 spec book um, is the only one that is now relevant. In addition to that, if you happen to be searching for the section 935, which covers fiber optic systems, that uh, particular spec is not located in the main spec book and you will need to go to the special and project specific provisions drop down menu and be sure to select supplemental specification not published in 2021 edition. And from there you will receive a, a drop down menu of additional specs and that is where you will find the updated version of the fiber optic system spec. Just a brief overview of the spec book that contains over 2000 pages with about 400 plus sections. The traffic signal and ITS portion of the spec book um, is only about 300 pages. This is a list of recently updated specs. Um, so it'd be good if you're doing any work related to these items, just to check the GDI website to make sure that you are operating from the most current updated version of these reference materials. Also note that with the new updates of the spec book, we will be reevaluating all of the products on the QPL. And if you have any questions about the reevaluation process or adding a new product um, to the QPL list, you can direct any questions via email to QPL48 at dot.ga.gov. Also, another reference document that will be up, updated relatively soon is the traffic signal design guidelines. Um, that is currently in the final stages of revision and will be released soon. And at this point, um, I will get ready to transfer the portion of the presentation over to Mark Stark um, to cover the traffic signal construction details. Thank you, Aaron. Here we go. All right, looks like we're locked and loaded here. Yeah, thanks for the uh, intro, Aaron, and uh, good afternoon. Um, we are really excited to, um, you know, really help the industry understand what the impacts of the new specifications are. And it's not dramatic, but there are certainly uh, significant areas where um, things need to change on plan sheets and so forth and expectations during construction. So uh, we hope this is helpful. As, as Aaron said, uh, there's the QPL 48 um, email address. That's kind of the official way to ask uh, questions and so forth um, uh, of this process. Um, as we 
uh, look at this. Uh, I believe Bill has already posted to the ITS Georgia website and provided a link to the to the information that we're uh, conveying today, which includes the presentation. It also includes the plan example um, that we'll talk about in a minute. And we'll also uh, look at a traffic signal spec, uh, spec checklist that may be helpful. And also there should be a PDH certificate that's available uh, shortly um, after this presentation ends. So we are at the point of looking at the, tr the construction details, which I believe I just saw an email this morning stating that these have been posted to the ITS or to the GDOT website. So I believe this is no longer pending. Um, and uh, feel free to take a look at those details. We are not going to go through those in their detail uh, today. We're going to focus more on uh, pay items and uh, basically how is work divided on the plan set um, as we move forward. So looking at the three major specifications that comprise traffic signals, we have 647, 925, and 937. 647 and 925 are really uh, a pair of specifications, one that covers construction only, and the other one that covers the material side of traffic signals. So they really need to be looked at together to get the full view of all the aspects of the traffic signal work. And in parallel to that, section 937 covers all the detection related items and is also used by uh, not just traffic signals, but also for ITS design. So um, hopefully it gives you a sense of where to look and um, to put a little flush on that in section 647, this really covers the, the timeline, the, the life cycle of, of the project. Uh, through construction all the way to measurement, payment, and warranty. So you can look for those items in that specification. And then um, more uh, granularly, um, section 925 includes all these different parts of a traffic signal installation. Please note that this does not include things like mast arms, poles, uh, conduit, pull boxes, those are actually covered in other specifications. And to confirm, those sections did not get updated. Um, so we're really talking about kind of the electronic side and the um, um, technology side of traffic signals as opposed to the uh, conduit poles, kind of the infrastructure side of traffic signal design. So looking at this list, you know, this covers a lot of different areas. And uh, we're not going through all these areas. Uh, you may be grateful to hear that, but we do want to point out, you know, where do things change in re with respect to, to, you know, pay items and things that really drive how is work done. Before we get into that detail, I just want to note that we, um, we spend a considerable amount of time uh, working with industry and with GDOT locally and throughout the state to solicit comments on the specs. There were many review cycles. We received over a thousand comments that we reconciled as we put the specs together. And um, we culminated that with a number of stakeholder meetings that occurred just over a year ago. You may have been part of that and thank you if you provided comments. This is the culmination of all that. And um, you know, this is not the end of the conversation for sure, but it is certainly a new time uh, with respect to the, the traffic signal details. Uh, to, to begin, um, you know, the traffic signal legend has been updated, so you'll want to make sure that gets into your plans, but it was more of a reorganization than new material, and what I'm just highlighting here on this slide is that uh, there's a, a significant need to put uh, virtual types of detections on the plan, both the device and the detection zone to which it applies. So now to really talk about the heart of the matter, which is how did the pay items change? And um, this is related to, first of all, the installation pay items in section 647. Um, you can see that the traffic signal pay item actually did not change. It's pretty much used as it was before. 
except that all detection is paid for separately from the, this installation pay item. And we'll talk about that in greater uh, amounts in just a minute. But you can see that there's five additional pay items representing other types of installation, which were previously kind of lumped into traffic signal, uh, the lump sum for that. And we felt it was necessary given the variety of types of work going on, including ramp meters, pedestrian hybrid beacons, rapid flash beacons, that it was important to have a separate pay item uh, for those items. So you can see at the bottom the, the uh, syntax for these types of pay items and it mirrors very much how the traffic signal installation pay item was used previously. And then just to pause for a moment and note that uh, there is partial payment for these installation pay items and it is unchanged uh, from the previous specification version. Then um, on the detection side, this is really the more um, newsworthy aspect of how the pay items changed in that we now have a menu of different detection pay items. And it includes inductance loop, as, as an option, or we have three other types of video uh, or uh, vehicle detection, including video, microwave, and wireless. And in addition to that, we have pedestrian detection. So there's actually a separate pay item to cover pedestrian detection as opposed to uh, vehicle detection. And these are lump sum items, just like uh, the installation lump sum item. So we're following that that mold. And you can see the examples at the bottom, which again, uh, take the same syntax as, as the other lump sum installation pay items. So beyond that, we have two new pay items related to construction phase, and we'll talk about those. And we have two that are related to continuous count stations, which we're not gonna talk about today, but we felt was important given that's a type of detector and often used in the state of Georgia. So as we look at the detection system types, and there were four different ones for, for vehicle detection, we, uh, we want to emphasize that these detection pay items are based on performance requirements. And so this slide basically takes the key tables out of the spec to highlight that uh, we're really focusing on the function of the different detector opportunities. And uh, there's an accuracy requirement for those different functions. This is important because we really want to get to a performance-based approach to detection. And so it doesn't matter whether you're doing video or microwave or inductive, the same accuracy requirements apply and these accuracy percentages were developed with input from stakeholders and you know, lots of discussion about what, what would, you know, provide the sufficient function of these different detectors. And so, uh, and also the type of uh, uh, calculations you would do to verify the accuracy are already also specified in, in the various sections, in this case, section 937. So we're, um, we're really promoting the, the, the performance-based and beyond that, each different type of detection technology has a type A and a type B uh, opportunity. And so to illustrate for pedestrian detection, there's a type A and a type B underneath that pay item to say that if, if you pick type A, you're picking kind of your standard push button, your contact closure type of push button, um, but if you pick type B, then you're looking at an accessible pedestrian detector that's going to have a tactical arrow, audible uh, indications, and the additional wiring and hardware needed to support those functions. 
So this becomes important as we look at the plan sheets. Uh, the plan sheet will need to note whether you are asking for a type A or a type B type of pedestrian detection system. Uh, similarly, for example, video detection, we have type A and type B. In this case, type A is your um, normal camera-based image, uh, but type B is infrared, uh, looking at you know, the heat signatures and so forth. You know, both are a camera, but one is um, you know, certainly more prevalent and the infrared sensor certainly has additional capabilities uh, available through the thermal imaging. So again, the, the, detect, the, the, the designer needs to talk with the local agency, figure out what kinds of functions are really needed and therefore you know, apply whether it's a type A or a type B to the, to the project. So that goes for pretty much all the detection types that you need to pay attention to what the functional needs of the inter intersection is, what are you trying to achieve and apply the type A or type B type of detection um, appropriately. So to summarize uh, the, the design process, which really is not markedly different at all from, from previous, uh, you know, the designer needs to talk with the agency, figure out what preferences there are, and uh, talk about the technology type that's good for maintaining that intersection and so forth. And then show the detection zones on the plans. This is already something that's uh, done pretty much all the time. And then after that, we need to assign, is it a type A or type B flavor underneath each type of detection in order to make sure we get our functionality right. And then finally, uh, step four is what we already do as well, which is show all the infrastructure for the traffic signal, the poles, pedestals, the cabinet, to say, this is the stuff you can hang devices on. And if you can't hang a device on it, I suppose it needs to be noted on the plan so that the contractor can say, hey, vendor, we're using, we want to use this type of detection. Um, can it fit and work adequately on this traffic signal installation? The reason being, you know, detection is the thing that's changed the most over the five to 10 years. And so we're trying to get away from being all prescriptive and perfect about is that exactly what a microwave detection can live with? It's going to be now be more incumbent on the on the vendor and contractor to say, yep, that's within the appropriate distances for providing uh, the detection uh, necessary. And if not, if the more infrastructure is necessary, then the contractor needs to be advised as they settle their bid. So that's uh, the design process. Again, I don't think that's functionally that much different than today, but we're trying to be a little more clear on that. Now I wanna talk about uh, the two pay items that relate to construction. And I'm not seeing the chat function right now on my computer. So if I need to hear anything, uh, Aaron, just interrupt me here. During construction, we, we would recognize that there's been some challenges with you know, maintaining detection during phases of construction and so forth. So there are two new pay items to use. And uh, the first one is intended to be used if there is a, you know, a reconstruct project where there's gonna be a number of different construction phases that last a long time. And you know, we kind of would expect that either the uh, design is going to uh, accommodate a, a virtual detection item to accommodate the multiple phases or, and, and if so, then this pay item would be appropriate so that the contractor is engaged and paid for each time the, the um, configuration of the detection needs to change. So this, this remains an opportunity, I, I just copied the, the definitions in here. And then the second type is similar, but a little different in that it's when you realize, you know, we can't use the existing detection or the future detection. We need to have a temporary detection. And that's where we're basically telling the contractor, bring in your own detection system, um, configure it. And then when the project's done, remove it. And in order to accommodate that, 
the designer would have to say, here's the phases at the particular intersection for which we are saying, we need to have detection all the time. Contractor, here's your pay item for providing that service from installation to removal, which means this detection system remains owned by the contractor. They're simply facilitating temporary detection as required. So those are two pay items. We hope help the industry to be a little more um, um, intensive when it comes to providing detection during construction. I'm gonna hand it off to Travis Hurt. Travis is our traffic signal designer who's um, you know, close to the action. And so he's gonna show uh, us what, what kind of um, support documents we're developing which are still in draft form, but uh, we think really put some flesh on what does it mean to go through the new process, how it impacts the design, and then also how does that impact the plan sheets? And Travis yeah. just finished. Get the screen up here. So I want to take a look at things from uh, what does what do these updated specs mean from a design perspective? And <clears throat> so in order to make sure that we are addressing all these new specs, we put together this designer checklist, which is uh, kind of just a, a list of questions that we want to make sure we're asking as we're going through the process from you know set up with our maintaining agency about what network is this going to be on, what kind of preferences do we have, on to which type of devices we're going to put through here. And this, this list, I believe, is posted on the ITS Georgia website. You'll notice there's several sections for detection specifically, because that is kind of the major part when you're talking about a traffic signal design. So we, we did that and then off uh, next to that in the column, we put which spec we need to be looking at as we're asking these questions to make sure that we've got the updated information. So then we wanna look at what we are gonna be looking at when we're updating a traffic signal design, just a basic design. So we got, I, I just tried to pull up an example and see what we need to change to make this work with these new specs. And I found this example. It had both uh, radar detection and inductance loops and also pedestrian detection. So we went through and I tried to figure out how we were going to update callouts for this to address these new detection devices. And that wasn't working very cleanly. What we figured out is we basically just need to have a note we still are using the same sorts of devices. We still have our radar detectors. We still have our loops and our wiring for that. So it's just being paid for in a different way. So the main thing that we needed to do on the plan sheet is to address what type of detection we have. So we've just added a note for the detection types down in our notes section. So I'll zoom in here on that. So we just added this note specifically in this particular uh, design, we have phases two, five, seven are using that microwave detection. It's that lump sum item. So just one lump sum for the intersection and this type B because we're doing traffic signal and not a freeway application. And then phase six is using the inductance loops in this, in this example. It's just the one lump sum for the whole intersection. And then we have our pedestrian detection, one lump for the intersection for all the phases. And this is type A, which is just your basic, basic pedestrian push button. It's not audible, accessible in this example. So the bigger changes kind of come when we start trying to put the quantities in. So previously we've had our 647, 1000 lump sum list of materials, the materials that comprise that lump sum for the design and the table and then below that, we would have a table of our pay items, including that 647 lump sum, but any additional pay items as well. So in this case, we're adding separate tables 
for the lump sum items for our detection. So we just added those below our 647 1000 list. And we're including those also in our list at the bottom. And so what we did here is we pulled out the items from the 647 list before that are now included in the 937 items. So in this example, we've got our 9, 937 4000 item for the inductance loops. And so we pulled out uh, our loop detector cards, our lead-in wire and detector wire, and our saw cuts, which were previously on the 647 sheet, and are now included under that 937 4000 pad. And we've got our lump sum below that for our pedestrian detection. Uh, we pulled out push buttons. We pulled out the wiring for that. We pulled out a couple isolators, blend those on. And then we've got our 937 uh, 6010 pay item is our microwave vehicle detection. And this was already a pay item before, but since we're doing it as a lump sum instead of an individual item, we pulled out specifically, we've got four detection units, we've got a communications module, we've got cables associated with that. And then we've got those and we've added them all down here in our pay items list as well. And we also updated in this case, the CCDB camera to our new pay item since we have some new pay item types for it. So I think that's that's hopefully gonna cover the changes that we'll need on a design perspective, uh, design sheets. So uh, I'll move along and turn it back over here if we've got any questions. Um, yeah, thanks, Travis. You want me to keep sharing, Mark? Yeah, sure, that'd be fine. So we wanted to get get the presentation done, you know, before before uh, three thirty, so we we can make sure we cover questions. We've got plenty of other stuff we can we can talk about, but um, just want to make sure that the essence of what we said is reasonably clear. You know, the good news is that uh, you know while there's changes to the pay items, it's pretty elegant to address them on the plan sheets. And, you know, we expect with the new specs uh, being uh, active right now that um, it's important that uh, plan uh, projects are, are being submitted, you know, using the new pay items. Um, so again, uh, these materials are available on the ITS Georgia website and we're talking with GDOT about exactly uh, where should those should be permanently um, but that's uh, that's kind of a starting point for for this discussion all right so we're getting a question thank you um, Aaron do you want to lead us into the questions yeah so it looks like Amanda says how does the new LS detection pay items affect ITS projects. Is the LS pay item needed per pole location? For example, if there are 40 different pole locations, will 40 separate LS pay items be needed? Yeah, so thanks for bringing up ITS because that is nearly always involved, especially if you're doing a you know traffic signal design project that's got some type of system component to it. So we're going to talk about the ITS pay items at the, the next open house. Um, I guess it's fair to say that the ITS pay items get paid for and installed under the rules of section 942. So things like cameras, fiber optic cable, switches, things like that are, are not included in the lump sum installation pay item. The lump sum installation pay item is, is a, uh, you know, a per installation, which I would, I would characterize as, you know, per controller. Um, and I'll, I'll just stop for a minute. Travis, is that, would, would you agree with everything I've just said about how to delineate what an installation is? I think that's a fair breakup. I, I imagine there are different ways you can go about it, but I would think everything running on one controller would be one system. So that would constitute the one lump sum. So for each 
additional controller you need to run that, that's probably an additional lump sum. So if it's on the plan sheet, normally it's going to be one plan sheet per controller. You know, that's that's how we're we're looking at this as as you would apply a, a lump sum pay item to you know a, a plan sheet. Um, so I, we don't expect that it, there'd be a lump sum per poll. Um, polls, you know, are very much uh, each type of item, and they're actually covered under you know a separate uh, a separate specifications and pay items. So ITS design is actually tremendously different, not tremendously, but it's fundamentally different because it's more about a la carte pieces of that, that comprise each individual pay item, uh, which is different than the, the installation lump sum approach. Um, Travis, can you just back up a few slides to, I think it's slide 29-ish or something like that? Yeah, 30, there you go. So it's a, a little overwhelming to try to describe what all the changes are in the spec from a, a granular perspective. And, you know, we, we really started the specs nearly from scratch. So, you know, they're gonna read a lot differently than the previous specs. There's three things we wanted to highlight just to say, hey, this is what the spec says about these items. And these are probably the most recurring topics. So I thought I'd cover those for a minute. And again, feel free to keep adding questions to the, to the chat as, as we go along here. The first one is inductance loop installation. And the spec uh, says, you're that a one part loop sealant mixture is required. And actually the full description of the sealant is referenced from another spec. So we're not trying to spec it again uh, in, in section 937. So you'd have to go to section 833. So by reference, we're, we're clearing up that, that uh, item about the, uh, the sealant mixture. And then uh, the second thing is that the saw cut needs to be completely dry. And thirdly, the sealant needs to be, you know, a depth of three inches above the top conductor. So, um, you know, I think there's a, a number of challenges to uh, inductive loop installation. And um, here, this is what, just to see chapter and verse, this is what the, the spec says. Uh, next slide. Also, the spec uh, ha already had wiring standards. I would say they were changed minimally, but it's probably worth checking this out. We know different agencies have different preferences in this regard. This is what the spec says. So there's no harm in, I suppose, depending on what your agency needs to, to address, uh, change this. But um, we just want to make sure you know that GDOT, this is GDOT's preference, and it would be worth you know, keeping an eye on this as you're talking with, with, to whatever agency you're doing work with to make sure that um, this gets done to their satisfaction um, at the end of the day. Uh, next slide. And then, um, you know, after uh, I've, you know, being part of the industry for some time, there's been a number of different philosophies on how many conductors uh, are applied to different traffic signal heads. And the spec has settled on um, a single seven conductor head going to every traffic signal uh, phase and right turn overlap. So basically, we're only seeing seven conductors used for anything that relates to vehicle displays. Um, so that's a great simplification of, uh, of what's been uh, considered in the past. And then next slide. This one probably has the most physical uh, ramifications. And that is uh, for grounding electrodes, 
there's a minimum of three per pole pedestal or controller cabinet assembly, and there's also spacing requirements. So you start doing the math on this, and this takes quite a bit of area to do. Just please keep in mind that these requirements were developed with a lot of input from a lot of people, and grounding is a topic that will always be with us, I'm sure. But this is what the spec says, and that the grounding electrode length increases from eight to 10 feet, and the test requirements are 25 ohms as a, as a uh, reference to another section that is 682. So those are things that I know have been talked about since traffic signal design began, and that is currently the, the specs. Aaron, should we go back to the questions in the chat? Yeah, we have a question from Ross about if, while we're talking about grounding electrodes, if three grounding electrodes are required at each pole location, how is this to be accomplished in downtown areas and in concrete islands? So certainly uh, compromise space is an issue. Um, I think that's gonna have to be re remain at, at the field uh, level. Obviously, if there isn't room it, and it's physically impossible, then plan B will have to be enacted. The spec does not talk about plan B. Uh, the, the spec is trying to um, influence and um, um, emphasize that that grounding um, needs to be done in such a way. And certainly there will be field decisions that need to be made. And then also there's a question about when the updated traffic signal design gu guideline document is expected to be released. Um, I don't have an official date on that yet. I'm hoping that within the next couple of months it will be released, but hopefully at the next open house, we can follow up on that and have a more, more concrete release date for that. Very good. So at this point, I'd like to just maybe go through the checklist a little bit. And um, Travis, if I can get the screen back. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna bring up the full size because it's a little bit tiny. So uh, hold on just a moment. All right, is that broadcasting? It is. Great. Um, so what we thought we would do is provide supplemental information uh, that would be useful to designers um, as we're particularly trying to take full advantage of the new specs and all the options available, and then also make sure there's enough questions and you know, checkpoints about how do the pay items get furnished or uh, fashion, shall we say? Because as we know, um, you know, that's the point of uh, challenge. Once this pro the project is out and bid and in construction is what exactly do those pay items represent? So I think we've done as much as we can to put a spotlight on that. And um, certainly there are more options uh, available in the, in the specifications now. And so I wanna highlight some of those. And so that's under number three here. And I hope you can see this, I'll blow it up as much as I can. And um, I'm gonna selectively pull from this, uh, such as, um, you know, let's make sure that the agency you're working with is um, comfortable with the type of detection, um, pedestrian detection. Um, and we, we also know that under number 12 here, you know, in the past getting, um, I think all traffic signal face colors were yellow, and now the spec allows for black. That was a point of much discussion usually um, if, if a local agency had different um, uh, preferences. And we also have three different types of span wire mounting type. 
And, you know, we know GDOT will, will want one kind, and that may actually change with which district you're in. So these are things that are not normally noted on the plans, but I do want to make it clear this, the spec doesn't nail down one type or another. Um, so that, that remains a, 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 an option um, to, to the construction process. Um, we also have, for instance, uh, three different types of uninterruptible power supplies. There's three different configurations that can be chosen from in the spec. And so that would be something that needs to be uh, noted on the plans. So there's 15 different questions. We think it's a good checklist as a designer begins the process and uh, hopefully that resolves anything before it gets to the construction um, phase. We also did selectively pick these three items I just went over that are now sort of locked in in the specifications and not to say that someone can uh, serve the public agency by making changes, but without making changes, the, the spec locks in the seven conductor cable for all the vehicle heads. Um, it locks in 100% LED signal vehicle faces with back plates with a two inch reflective border as well as these grounding requirements I talked about. So again, these are all things that I know are, are dear to the heart of various uh, local agencies and would be worth a discussion to make sure that expectations are correct as the plans go out for bid. And I've lost my chat box. If anyone can tell me, Aaron, can you tell me if there's a chat question or two in there? I do not see any additional questions. Okay. So I'll continue on this. Uh, the checklist includes the pay item names that are now active. And um, just a heads up, the old pay item names remain active in, I believe it's the Ashtoware system. Travis, is that correct? I believe they're still in Ashtoware and also still in the pay item index, if you got what happened, she outside. So this is just a cautionary moment to realize that uh, the old pay items are probably going to remain for whatever period of time, uh, because you know there are plans still going into the into the uh, bidding process under the old specs since the new specs are so new. So um, just be aware. Hopefully the checklist will help you identify old versus new pay items. And then on page two, it's mainly about the detection items that I went through and you know, the, the, the need for the designer to show type A or type B, the need to show the detection zones, uh, to show the function of the detection. And we also include all the um, detector pay items, hopefully again, so that you can see what the old is versus the new. Uh, we also, include quick descriptions of these construction phase pay items that are brand new. And if you use them, it would be good to uh, provide things like the estimated number of construction phases and uh, you know which traffic signal phases to which these pay items would apply. That is what, what phases of, of the intersection of the controller are really needed to uh, be maintained as the focus of, of these pay items. Um, so again, hopefully this sets expectations for exactly how these pay items would be applied um, to a construction project. They are not mandatory. They are simply there uh, available for the designer's use, uh, recognizing there is some challenges with, with the fact that um, you know, usually a road reconstruct project is is uh, is won by a large prime contractor. The, tra the traffic signal contractors usually sub to that, and um, may not always get the call to serve, or may get the call to serve without um, you know recognizing that there's there's somehow money involved with that, right? So again, using a pay item, we think um, may be a, a wise move in order to coordinate the work of the prime contractor with the, the traffic signal contractor to a greater degree. 
Uh, number 10 is what I was talking about with there's plenty of things that could go into a traffic signal system that are actually ITS elements and would be uh, uh, pay items under ITS uh, specifications and under the section 942 section. And so it's noted here, if you do include ITS devices, you have created an ITS project and you need to use section 942, which is that configuration and integration pay item uh, in order to make sure the ITS is uh, fully integrated into the project. And then the last couple of things here, uh, one is recognizing we've got new construction details or highly revised construction details that may apply. I pointed to three things that may be useful to a designer to make sure the design is in fact compatible with the existing say um, poles and the, the mounting heights of the span and things like that that may be important to note. Um, also, there's three different UPS configurations uh, that are allowable under the spec. We're not saying that these uh, that there is a, a full market available for all these uh, options, but we wanted to kind of kind of lay out a, a template for when and how um, the configuration would apply to to a UPS. So this gets into quickly the QPL part of things, and that's that's another discussion for another day. But certainly, there's plenty of work going on right now to make sure that there is a um, approved QPL item available for each and every one of these pay items that uh, are in the new specifications. So that's just a quick review of this um, checklist. And if you have comments on it, feel free to provide them. Again, it's just to try to give a little more of a, um, a second opinion about what it means to be uh, plan ready uh, under these new pay items. Aaron, any other comments in the chat? There are not any. So um, what we're going to do in um, next month is do a similar thing for ITS. And um, we can certainly field questions during that session um, about some of the mat subject matter that we, we talked about today. Um, but I just wanna emphasize that uh, there's, there's these um, supplementary materials on the ITS Georgia website that uh, again, if you're a designer trying to put a plan set together and get it approved, we hope these things are helpful. We also recognize this is the first time for applying these things. So um, if there are updates, uh, we're, we're here to continue to provide clarification and would emphasize using the QPL 48 um, email address in order to make those requests um, officially of GDOT. So if there's no other questions, I think we've done the drill for today and we'll give 10 minutes back for your use uh, for today. Is there anything else? Um, I'll give it uh, 15 seconds here in case there's anything else on folks' mind, but uh, we really appreciate you tuning in. And um, again, this is intended to be helpful for the entire traffic signal design community. So if you think there is uh, something here that we may have overlooked, uh, feel free to ping us and uh, we'd be happy to respond and hopefully provide some uh, clarification. And Mark, I do see one more question. Um, there's a question about partial payment. It says, is there any partial payment for the lump sum detection pay items or is it 100% pay once activated? I believe uh, that is um, a lump sum. I don't believe there is partial. Um, I don't recall that, I'd have to, look at chapter and verse, but that's my off the cuff uh, memory.
All right. Hey, thanks everyone. Um, this will be recorded. This has been recorded and it should be on the ITS Georgia website uh, shortly. And uh, again, thanks for uh, participating and we look forward to any comments or responses you may have. Have a great day.